So this is, uh, some of you may have seen this image. It's a, a radar map of, uh, of Titan, um, a moon of Saturn. And uh, it, the scale is about 400 kilometers from left to right. So you can see, I think, uh, pretty clearly the, uh, the main channels here of this system flowing into some sort of a body of water here. The lake looks like a delta deposit in here. Nice meandering channel there. Uh, again, just to indicate that uh, rivers are not uh, exclusive to Earth, as we'll see in a few minutes. So this is me. Um, I'm uh, in the School of Environmental Science at, uh, uh, at SFU, adjunct professor. Um, been doing research on rivers for too long. So what is a river? This is kind of a, of a, of a, a vague definition here, but I wanted to keep it vague because uh, a lot of the definitions you find of rivers are, are, are earth centric. So I wanted to make this a little bit broader. So it's, it's a river is a channel system constructed by naturally flowing liquid. And as we'll see, there can be different types of liquids that form uh, river channels, moving towards an ocean, sea, lake, or another river. And rivers are found on Earth, we all know that. I think most of us know that rivers or ancient rivers, Pele rivers are found on Mars. Uh, Titan, you may or may not be aware of, has, uh, has rivers flowing on there, quite unusual and very quite different than, uh, than Earth, although a lot of uh, similarities morphologically. And oddly enough, Venus. So I put an exclamation and question mark there because before I started to do, do the, uh, the research for this, I didn't really know that there was even any evidence for rivers on Venus. And I'm not sure how strong that evidence, evidence is, but we'll have a look at it. And what rivers do is modify the landscape, they create drainage networks and a whole variety of channel erosional and depositional landforms. And fluvial geomorphology, fluvial for fluvius river, geomorphology, study of the landscape or landforms, study of the processes and patterns created by rivers. And that's my moniker as a fluvial geomorphologist. Now you may recognize this place, just in case you didn't, I put a big uh, 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 earth label on it. Um, most of our knowledge of rivers, of course, comes from earth. And uh, in, you'll find in, in most cases of uh, uh, studies of extraterrestrial rivers, um, the, uh, they use earth analogs as, as, as uh, counterparts for what are seen on Mars, for example, or Titan, or even Venus. So one of the, the broader scales that one uh, looks at rivers and river channels is by looking at the drainage network. And this is a really a very, very complex uh, subject. And uh, uh, it's very useful for looking at extraterrestrial rivers because often uh, all we can really see are, are, are the remnants or even current active drainage networks from the various types of imagery that we get on these uh, uh, extraterrestrial uh, uh, places. So there's lots of different ways of classifying these things, but by looking at the drainage network, you can get some idea of the, of the controls on the channel pattern. So there are uh, dendritic, these are horizontal, that form on generally in horizontal and uniform strata. Uh, we'll look at some examples of these a little bit later. A parallel, or you have uh, active uh, faulting and, and folding, you can get channels that are running uh, parallel to one another, as you can see in that uh, panel B there. Um, trellis, bands of hard and soft beds. So you can get uh, a variety of uh, channel uh, networks here. Again, they tend to be somewhat parallel. And then the tributaries are almost uh, orthogonal to the main channels. Again, usually connected with uh, variations in lithology, hard, for example, hard and uh, relatively hard and relatively soft uh, erodible beds. Radial, these are on topographic domes. As you can see, the channels radiate out from a center dome. Centrifugal, these occur on meander loops. These are fairly uncommon, but they're part of this classification. And this is from a book by uh, Hug Huggett in uh, 2011. Uh, centripetal, where you have a basin, a little lake, for example, and you have channels that are uh, flowing into the, into the basin in a sort of a radial pattern as well. Distributary channels, these occur on alluvial fans and deltas. So this is where a main channel that's transporting water and sediment splits up into a number of smaller channels. Usually these are related to depositional uh, processes that occur uh, where the channels diverge. 
rectangular, again, joints and faults can cause these types of, uh, of uh, channel networks. You can see that a lot of these, some of these are quite similar to one another, and sometimes it's fairly difficult to tell or to label a particular landscape in terms of the exact type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, pattern. An annular, a dome or a basin with bands of hard and soft rock. And these are only, what, nine different channel uh, patterns. There are a lot more than that that have, uh, appear in various, uh, uh, various sources. But uh, I thought this would just be a good kind of introduction to the types of things we see on Earth and forms a basis for what we see on other um, uh, bodies, planetary bodies or bodies within the solar system. So the Amazon River, as we all know, I think you probably know, is the uh, largest river in the world. It has uh, a discharge that is uh, greater than the next uh, 10 largest rivers combined. So it's a very, very large system. It has its own climate. And if you look overall in the Amazon system, you'll see, particularly in the lower reaches here, it's, it has a dendritic pattern. So again, similar to what I just showed you. So in the middle and lower reaches, um, the substrate is uh, the, uh, the Brazilian shield, which is like the Canadian shield, but much more heavily eroded. And there's an overlying sedimentary rock fill on top of that. So it's a relatively flat uh, area uh, of, the, uh, of South America, of Brazil, and the river channels form a uh, dendritic pattern. You look, if you look in the upstream areas though, here and where the Andes are over in Ecuador and Peru and in this area here, you can see some examples of parallel and trellis patterns controlled by faulting and folding and lithological variability in the Andes. Again, this is just one example of a lot of uh, watersheds and drainage basins we uh, you can see uh, uh, all over the planet. Now we could, we classify channels in a whole variety of different ways. And uh, the two main types of, of classification uh, schemes look at bedrock channels or alluvial channels. And we'll look at these and we'll look on some variants as well. So a bedrock channel is a channel incising into bedrock that is resistant to erosion. So this is lithified material uh, that the uh, channel is eroding into. Difficult to erode, uh, but even so, they, the channel, the rivers do erode and create river valleys and they create patterns within the types of rivers. And one of the things that type of patterns that are created are called steps and pools. So this photograph is from a small stream in Kananaskis Park in Alberta. And in the foreground here, you can see this kind of steep face here and the, and the water's coming over and dropping down this steep face. Just on the other side of this is a pool. And then just a bit, a little ways upstream, you'll find another one of these. So you get these re rep repetitive uh, patterns of a bed form essentially that form and they're called step and pool sequences. So this is an example of the step here and then behind that is a pool. You also get canyons and gorges, waterfalls and incised meanders. So the top left here, this is Iguazu Falls in, uh, in South America on the border between uh, um, Brazil and Argentina. So one of the uh, typical uh, characteristic of bedrock channels or waterfalls. You can see the falls here. And you can also see there's a canyon here. And the control on this is largely geological. That is, there's a, a fault system here that's created this. And the, uh, the channel, the river has, the uh, Rio uh, Paraná River has, has eroded into the, uh, into the, uh, the bedrock. And an interesting example down here on the bottom right, this, this loop here is in Utah in the US. And you can see that the loop of the, of the river has incised almost vertically. It's maintained its meandering shape. And we'll talk about meandering rivers in a little while. It's retained its shape. And over millions of years, the, the uh, uh, local topography has lifted up. So the topography has been uplifting vertically and the river continued to erode. So the net result is you get this canyon, if you will, that forms these entrenched meanders uh, that you can see here. Now, the other main type of channel, as I said, are called alluvial channels. And these are channels that flow through their own deposits. So they erode and deposit material uh, that they have eroded and deposited. So uh, in any particular, uh, uh, 
alluvial channel system, also in, in uh, bedrock channels. These, these types of sediment uh, transport mechanisms also occur there. Their main job in uh, bedrock systems, though, is to erode and, uh, uh, and uh, wear away the bedrock. But here, the channels are eroding and depositing uh, the material that they previously deposited. So bed load is sand and gravel moving close to the bed. You can see in this nice little diagram here. So channel particles that are saltating or hopping along the bottom or rolling and sliding along the bottom by a saltation or by traction or what we call bed load. A suspended load is sand and mud moving above the bed. So these smaller particles are lifted above the bed by turbulence within the flow and are transported downstream. So they, they travel a, a, a significant distance up from the bed as opposed to bed load, which moves along the bed. Dissolved load is material that's dissolved, that it's in solution in the, uh, in the river. And it usually doesn't play very much of a role in, uh, in uh, morphology of the, uh, of the channel. And mixed load is a combination of suspended and bed loads. And there's been a lot of research over the years that have related these mechanisms to the types of patterns that you see. Now this is a pretty busy diagram, but uh, it's a useful, uh, I think, way of, of looking at the types of channels that you get with these uh, these uh, different processes, these different mechanisms of uh, of sediment transport. So on the left is bed load. Here again, this is material, gravel, sometimes even boulders, cobbles that are moving along, or sand sometimes that are moving along close close to the bottom. Suspended load here again, a somewhat finer sediment, usually sand and and mud or silt and clay that's moving in the water column and mixed load is a combination of these two. So you can think of there being straight channels. So channels can develop pool and riffle sequences, much very similar to, similar to that step pool I showed you in a bedrock channel. Sometimes you can get a meandering tall wag. So the channel itself is straight, but within the channel, the deeper part of the flow of the tall wag the deepest part of the channel actually meanders along it within this relatively straight channel and deposits bars on either side. So the yellower bars here, the yellow areas here represent uh, depositional features that are just mainly composed of, of sediment. And the darker ones such as down here are, uh, are depositional features that uh, have uh, usually have vegetation on them. So there's a difference between the dark brown and the light brown. And down here, we can get a meandering tall wag again. They start to develop now where you go from here, you start to get erosion on the outside of the bend, erosion here, deposition on the inside of the bend, and the channel is starting to be bent or bendy or sinuous. And that's called a meandering channel. And as you get further down here, you get uh, uh, channels that are braided. What that means is there are islands or bars within the channel that split the main flow up into a variety of different smaller channels. Often there's one main channel and a variety of smaller channels. And then a fully braided system here is where you really get these, all of these multiple channels operating simultaneously. So the flow is going around and across these various sandbars. Go to suspended load on the other side here, straight channel, again, no real depositional features, sediment is just transported right through the reach. And then this is where you get really well-developed, very sinuous meandering channels. So you can see here, the channel has real bends to it. It's migrating in this direction. It's eroding on the outside of the bank, depositing on the inside. And as a result, you get bars called point bars on the inside of the bends and you get a road eroding banks on the outside of the bends. And these channels migrate or shift sideways. Another unusual type of channel looks a little bit like a braided channel in astabosum, but has a completely different uh, uh, depositional processes associated with it. But you get multiple channels, again, here, but you get vegetated islands that are, uh, separate uh, the channels. And then when you look at the mixed load, it's usually a mixture, a combination of a bed load type and a suspended load type. So again, you get pool and riffle sequences. You get more developed meandering channels here. Here where you're starting to get a little bit of braiding uh, coming in, where you're starting to get multiple bars here in the channel. And then you get braided um, uh, sections here where you're getting um, um, 
vegetated islands that separate the channels. So again, we could spend weeks talking about this and why the channels look the way they do, but this is just a good way of, of classifying uh, uh, channels that we can use as a basis for looking at channels on Earth and on other uh, bodies within the solar system. So here on the left is a braided river, a gravel braided river. You can see the bars here, there's really no island, no vegetation on these particular uh, bars. This is from a relatively small river in the Yukon. But again, you can see the multiple channels here coming through along down in here and these various islands. So these islands are constantly being created and destroyed by the, uh, by the flows. Over on the right side here, this is the Fraser River you know, near Agassiz, and it's a braided river, but now it's a, it has a, a bars without any sediment, oh, sorry, without any vegetation on them, but it also has islands with vegetation on them. So these islands are relatively stable in position, and these, these bars without vegetation on them are less stable. So these would be eroded and uh, transported downstream and deposited somewhere else quite frequently. Now, if you look at the bottom left, this um, almost looks like a, a river you would see on some other planet, but it's actually on the uh, south shore of Lake Athabasca. It's called the William River. And there's an Aeolian dune field here that uh, has been around for the Holocene or the last 10,000 or so years. And th this William River flows off of the Canadian Shield into Lake Athabasca, flows through the dune field. And the sediment that the dunes, the Aeolian dunes, windblown dunes deposit in the river create this remarkable braided pattern that you see here. So again, this now, this sediment is sandy compared to the slide above that's gravelly. So it creates these sandbars. But again, you can see the multiple channels. There's all sorts of interesting features. You can see some vegetation on some of the islands. And on the bottom right, scale of 10 kilometers, that's the Brahmaputra River. That's a much larger version of the William River on the left. So you can see this is about 20 kilometers across. This is the largest braided river in the world. Again, transports mainly sand, uh, and that comes from erosion of the Himalaya mountains that are just uh, in the upstream reaches of the river. And what I'm going to just talk about here, just really two examples of those different patterns I showed you, braided rivers, uh, the ones on this slide and meandering rivers that are on the following slide. So on the top left is a river that I worked on for many years. It's the Rewa River in Fiji. Um, this is a, an area, Fiji is an island that has uh, tropical cyclones almost annually, but not sometimes on, on average every two or three years, you get a really major tropical cyclone or hurricane. They're called tropical cyclones or typhoons in the this part of the world, and they create huge floods in these rivers that really cause the river channels to, to uh, uh, migrate very, very rapidly and really increase the, uh, the, the sedimentary processes that are going on within the channel. But again, here's a nice, beautiful meander bend here. This area here of sediment is the point bar, that sediment is being deposited. It's eroding on the outside of the bend here. And it leaves marks behind where the river was before. So the river used to be over here. It's migrated. It used to be over here. And now it's in this particular position. The top right is uh, a cut bank or an outer bank here that was eroded during a, a big tropical cyclone that occurred in uh, the year 2000. And when the cyclone, when the flow was at its peak, was over the top of the banks here. So it flooded this area here. And remarkably, here's someone standing on one of these slump blocks fishing. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. That is not a good place to be standing. So, but uh, there you go. But you can see the amount of erosion and the amount of slumping in the bank that this, uh, this caused. And finally, on the bottom, and the, the Rayra River is really a mixed load uh, meandering channel. On the bottom here, we have the Beaten River in northern BC. This is almost a completely suspended load meandering channel. So you can see the really sinuous pattern here. And you can see here examples here of oxbow lakes, here and here. So this channel at one point was flowing over here and then come back here, but it, the, the, uh, the bend got too extended and it becomes inefficient at moving sediment. So you get a cutoff. So now the channel is going here. Over here, this bend used to go over here, but now it's cut itself off and is moving here. And again, this is an example of what would be more of a suspended load uh, uh, channel. 
So that's a really uh, quick uh, review of, of channels that we see in, uh, on Earth. Um, now, where the uh, uh, rivers come to a, a stop, essentially, are on alluvial fans and deltas. So these are depositional features produced uh, by rivers. And alluvial fans are sediment, composed of sediment deposited where the river flows onto a flat surface, a land surface. They're deposited from rivers and or debris flows. Deltas are sediment deposited where, river flow, where a river flows into a standing body of water, a lake, or an ocean. And uh, these uh, features can be modified by waves and tides, as well as other process, processes, but they're the two main modifying factors. So the top left is a alluvial fan in Death Valley in California. So you can see the, the water when it, when it rains, which is rarely, uh, comes down this, this valley here. And you can see the bottom of Death Valley here. And it's produced this conical shaped structure here, uh, this alluvial fan. And this lighter colored area here is where recent debris flow came through. So most of the, the, de uh, the deposition on these types of features, these very, very arid areas here, uh, would be in a form of debris flows. So these are mud flows that, are, that, are, that can travel at very, very rapid rates uh, down a channel and deposit when they hit flat land. Now on the bottom right here, this is a different type of alluvial fan. This is Carrot Creek, which is between Canmore and Banff in Alberta. This is the Bow River here. And the fan is outlined by the red broken line there. This is the highway, number one highway, and the railway line is going through here. But these are formed by braided rivers, which is similar to that gravel one I showed you of, of the Yukon. So the channel Carrot Creek is coming out of the mountains here. It hits the flat land at the bottom of the, uh, the Bow River Valley and deposits its sediment. And it shifts back and forth across the landscape. You can see positions here where the channel used to be. And it deposit, has deposited this probably over the last five or 6,000 years. And this deposit, the sediment deposit in here is mainly from deposition from these braided rivers as opposed to debris flows here. Now deltas, there's a lot of ways of classifying these, but uh, this is a useful, very qualitative, although it is quantitative, you can quantify all of these processes here um, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the types of processes uh, that dominate the morphology of the delta. So, a river dominated delta, such as the Mississippi is always given as the classic example, is one where the, the features are deposited mainly from, from the river and they're not really being reworked significantly by waves or tides. So these occur in, in small lakes or sometimes even in the ocean where you have limited wave or tidal action. Um, the other end of the, uh, the, this, the corner, of this ternary diagram here, waves, so sediment is deposited by the river. So the South Francisco River here in Brazil is an example, flows into the Atlantic Ocean, very large, uh, strong wave action. So the sediment is coming in here, but it's quickly been removed, being removed by the waves and transported along the coast. So these tend not to be stick out too far into the, into the base and tend to be relatively small uh, because a lot of the sediment is eroded away by wave action. And tidal dominated over here. Again, the, the, uh, the river brings in the sediment, but there are strong macro tidal environments, usually greater than five meter high tidal range and a relatively low discharge or salt sediment transport rate from the river. So the, the tides rework the sediment that the river brings in into individual smaller channels. And these often have what is called a funnel shape. So they're wider at the mouth and narrow as you go upstream. So on the top left is the Mississippi Delta. So again, this is usually given as a classic, uh, the classic uh, river dominated Delta. In fact, it's probably pretty unusual. This kind of bird's foot morphology as it's called here. This is New Orleans here. You can see the river coming down here. This sediment body has been uh, deposited out into the Gulf of Mexico. But you can see there are uh, distributary channels breaking off of the main channel here. And if you look at it long enough, it sort of looks like a bird's foot. So it's called a bird's foot delta. Here's another type of delta. This is in Lillooet Lake in BC here. And the Lillooet River flows into Lillooet Lake. And it doesn't have anything similar to this bird, uh, bird foot morphology here. You can see here uh, two main, or one main channel coming and it splits a little bit in the middle. 
notice is a really distinct line here between the river water and the lake water. The river water is colder and has higher sediment concentration to the lake water. So it actually plunges under the lake water and flows offshore. We've measured uh, the flows offshore a couple of kilometers away. It's just, just booting along the bottom of the lake. So these things continue to deposit and transport sediment far offshore, but underneath the lake along the bottom. Here's the South Francisco. I just grabbed this off of Google Earth. Again, you can see the river here bringing sediment in and strong waves have deflected the mouth of the river here. You can see it's pushed the river towards the south and the sediment is being transported here towards the, uh, towards the south. So the river is bringing in the sediment and the waves are moving it away. And here's an example of the Fly River showing those multiple channels. Here's an example of the really nice uh, uh, funnel shaped channel again wider at the mouth getting uh, narrower as you go upstream. So this is an example of a tidally influenced or tidally dominated delta. Now a type of river I don't talk about very much but I thought it'd be useful for, for this particular presentation uh, because these channels are often used as analogs for Martian channels, uh, dry land rivers. And this is a classification scheme with examples from Australia. So some of the processes you see in dry land areas are, are very similar to what we think uh, go on or went on uh, some of the channels in, in Mars. The, mm -hmm. the details are not all, mm -hmm. all that important, but this is a through going maintaining channel, just meaning that the water is flowing right through the, uh, the system going from here, coming in here. And again, you can see the, the channel width has stayed pretty constant. Here's a through going declining. So it's making it all the way through, but it's getting narrower as you go downstream here and through going to continuous discontinuous declining again, declining somewhat as you go downstream and then breaking up into individual distributary type channels here. Discontinuous declining again, the discharge is declining, it's being evaporated or sinking in uh, to the underlying sediment and discontinuous terminating channel ends here. It doesn't make it through. Now here's some examples of dry land rivers. This is an interesting one because it's, it's somewhat analogous to what we think we see on Mars. So this is a, 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 the bed of a meandering river that is not active. This was buried underneath the sediment in the Sahara Desert for many years. And then the wind has eroded away the overlying sediment and exhumed this channel you can see here. So this is kind of a leftover from probably a previously uh, somewhat different climate uh, that was buried and then is being uh, uh, exposed by aeolian erosion. So similar probably to what we see on, the, on Mars. Uh, this is a, uh, a channel in, in South Africa. It's a combination of a bedrock channel and an alluvial channel has a, a, a multiple channel morphology and an astenosing morphology. You can see here many different channels. Some islands with vegetation, some islands are composed of bedrock, some are composed of sediment. And this river here is the Oliver River, if I remember, remember correctly, it's from a paper, that's why these numbers are on here. But this is used as, a, and I'll talk a little bit about the paper in a while, this is used as an analog for rivers on Mars, meandering channels on Mars, mainly because there isn't very much vegetation on the banks. Vegetation has the effect of, of uh, stabilizing the channel and making a, the banks uh, more difficult to erode, so it decreases the rate at which the channels shift sideways in, in meandering rivers. And this one is the Karaya River in China. It's also used as an analog for some Martian channels. This is kind of interesting. This is low flow, but you can see, and if you look at a map at a, on a Google Earth, it has a meandering pattern, so it has bends. But if you look in the channel, at least during the low flow condition, it's braided. So it's a gravel or sandy braided river within an overall meandering channel. So it kind of shows you how these things can get a little bit complicated. Now, again, something I don't typically talk about in when I, when I do fluvial geomorphology courses, but I'm going to in this case, because I think it's relevant certainly to, to uh, uh, features on Mars, are outflow channels. So these are large, mainly erosional features caused by catastrophic floods. And these floods, uh, we think in many cases, are often caused by the rapid drainage of glacial lakes. So particularly near the end of the last ice age, uh, this is when these types of features uh, were generated. 
And the channel scab lands in Washington, some of you may have seen this, were carved out when the glacier that plugged Pleistocene Lake Missoula collapsed. So this is a Cordillera ice sheet here, and this kind of orangey yellow area here, this is the channel scab lands. So there was a, a glacial lake here that uh, uh, the, the moraine or the ice that was damming the lake uh, burst and released a huge amount of water. Well, it will compare some of the, the amount of water that probably moves through here to some of the features on Mars uh, in a little while. And on the bottom right here, just think something I grabbed off of, uh, of uh, um, Google, um, the internet, just gives you a picture of what the channel scab lines in Washington look like. So really eroded, uh, uh, area here that was produced during some sort of a catastrophic flood that occurred from the drain and drainage of a glacial lake. Now, Mars, so that's Earth. That's Earth in what, less than half an hour. So uh, uh, now Mars, again, uh, when we talk about Mars, Titan and Venus, a lot less evidence and a lot more up to interpretation and a lot more arm waving as far as I'm concerned about the types of processes that are going on. So there's been uh, some fairly recent uh, uh, research on, uh, on, just a lot of research going on on Mars, but this is a paper that was published in the journal Science that talked about, talks about uh, the persistence of intense climate-driven runoff late in Mars history. So I think there's been a bit of a controversy as to how some of the channels formed that are found on Mars. But this particular paper, um, uh, proposes a precipitation fed uh, source for the types of rivers that they examined, at least anyway. So as we all know, Mars is dry today, but they believe there are numerous precipitation fed paleo rivers are found across the planet's surface. So the scale, what they mean by scale are width and wavelength, which are probably the only things you can really measure reasonably accurately on Mars, are the width of the channel and the wavelength of meanders of Mars paleo rivers is a proxy for past runoff. So by knowing channel width, knowing channel wavelength and using empirical relations that are developed mainly on Earth, you can get an estimate of the discharge and the amount of water that the river was transporting when it was formed. Turns out that the rivers on Mars, the paleo rivers are much wider than the rivers on modern Earth, which is interesting. And these people believe that there was intense runoff production uh, related to precipitation until less than 3 billion years ago, probably less than 1 billion years ago and was globally distributed. Here's a, uh, a diagram from, uh, from their paper. I just wanted to show you just to give you an idea of, uh, of, the, uh, of the type of, uh, of interpretations they've made from looking at these uh, paleo channels on Mars. So prior to this study, which was 2020, I believe, or 2019, uh, Irwin et al. Uh, estimated uh, uh, on the basis of looking at paleo channels that there were active uh, uh, precipitation driven uh, rivers up to just about three and a half billion years ago. Uh, and this study, which has a much higher uh, number of channels they examined, they proposed that uh, they were able to document channels from about three and a half billion to less than a half billion uh, uh, years ago. So this, this is a, quite an extension of this previous uh, uh, estimates here. And the bottom diagram here, the main thing here is to look at the, the, the uh, um, rates of fluvial erosion. Again, there's a lot of arm waving and a lot of empirical equations involved in these things uh, related to the discharges that they estimated from the river channels. And again, really, it's very, very difficult to, to, to put these all of these things in the proper geological uh, uh, framework or time frame, at least anyway. But this is what they, they, they propose are areas, periods of, uh, of fluvial erosion related to the rivers that they looked at again all the way down to just less, somewhat less than 1 billion years ago in the Amazonian. So here's an example of a drainage network on Mars and you can see the scale of 50 kilometers. So this is well over hundred kilometers in length here. It has a dendritic pattern, it seems. So you've got all of these smaller channels that are uh, coming together, tributary channels flowing into a major channel here and then flowing out over this flat area, probably depositing a bit of an alluvial fan down here. The only way you can get these types of channels though, these kind of dendritic pattern channels is through precipitation driven uh, runoff. 
So again, no, I have no date for this, but uh, who knows how old it is, but clearly at some point in time, there was precipitation that was driving runoff and the formation of a dendritic pattern on the surface. So alluvial channels, there are lots of alluvial channels on Mars. And one of the real differences with Earth is that a lot of the alluvial channels on Mars, mainly because they're old, so probably no more than uh, a half a billion to a billion uh, years ago, um, but the channels were active. So that's quite a while. And many of these channels on Mars are preserved as inverted channel deposits. So the, the little model here is that uh, by Davies, Davis et al. Uh, so you have a fluvial valley in A there, and it's uh, uh, eroded into the surrounding uh, uh, bedrock and there's sediment being deposited along the side of the valley as, as floodplain sediment. Changes in sediment supply, changes in climate, for example, or base level, that is the, the level the river is flowing into, uh, cause the valley to fill with channel and overbank deposits. So you can see here the channel and overbank deposits as the channel fills in with alluvial uh, deposits. Fluvial period ends, erosion of the overbank deposits by wind leaves behind a sinuous ridge of channel deposits. So the channel deposits are, are more difficult to erode for the wind than are the floodplain, the finer floodplain deposits. So the wind blows through here for a billion years or so, or maybe longer, and leaves behind these sinuous ridges. Now these ridges in, in not that long ago, within the last couple of decades, were interpreted as eskers deposited by glaciers, but a lot of them have been reinterpreted now as these inverted channel deposits. And alluvian uh, fans and deltas, uh, Aeolus, Aeolus dorsa, this is one of the areas of a, it's a large sedimentary basin in, on Mars. Um, this is an alluvial fan deposit that was deposited when the uh, river that uh, flowed into a lake or into, into a body of water, some sort of body of water, or sorry, into, the, uh, uh, into a flat, relatively flat area, deposited this alluvial fan and the sediment accumulated on top of it, the wind eroded it away and exposed it. So again, you have significant wind erosion exposing underlying material or exhuming underlying material. And I think this is kind of analogous to a fluvial fan on Earth, the one I showed you earlier, Carrot Creek, but probably without the vegetation. So again, it's probably a braided channel that was shifting back and forth across the surface here. And you can see it's a fairly substantial feature, a couple of kilometers, three, four, five kilometers in width, somewhat similar to a Carrot Creek fan. Now, uh, Janik uh, talked a little bit about the Jezero crater during his uh, presentation. I guess that's almost a month ago. This is an image from NASA, and this is a landing site at Perseverance rover, and this is where they're, they're, they're focusing their search for, uh, for life, for microbial life at least, or some evidence of microbial life. Uh, and, and I think mainly on this deltaic deposit here that's outlined by the, uh, the red box. And here's a close-up of that uh, deltaic deposit. You can see, you can see where the river channel comes through here. You can see the various distributary channels. It's almost has a bird foot type uh, uh, morphology to it. And again, you would expect that, that there wouldn't be significant waves. This isn't a very big, what is it, 50 kilometers. You might, you wouldn't expect significant wave activity in this relatively small basin if, if that's where the, uh, the delta was, uh, uh, if the body of water was confined by this, uh, this crater here. Um, and you wouldn't expect any tides here because I don't think the Martian moon can, uh, moons can uh, produce much of a tidal effect. So again, similar to the Mississippi, a river dominated delta. And dry land rivers. As I mentioned earlier, the Kenai River in China receives input from precipitation uh, from the Kunlun Mountains here. And the river gets a lot of water here and snow melt and then flows out into the Taklamaka Desert here and transports out and flows out and then disappears. So it's one of these discontinuous terminating channels similar to what you might find in Australia. And there's a channel on Mars that follows a similar pattern is interpreted basically the same way. So you have a highland area here, the Evros Vallis here, you have a high, an upland area here. So they're proposing that there's precipitation here that fed the channel that flowed out into this relatively dry surface here and then probably disappeared. So the uh, Karaya River is, a, is an earth analog of this Martian system. 
and outflow channels. So outburst floods on Mars are larger than those on Earth. And we'll look at this, uh, this uh, diagram at, at the bottom here in a moment. And the floods create an acid-moving channel, streamlined islands, as terraces and bed forms. So here's an example of a big outflow channel here. You could see some dunes, gravel dunes here uh, that have been formed by the feature. And acid-moving sort of the channels are splitting up. So you can see some streamland islands here. Again, characteristic and probably very similar in many ways to what you'd see in the channel scablands in, the, in Washington. Now, what's interesting is where you compare the channel cross sections for these channels on Mars, these two here and Earth are the lower channels. You look at this channel here, one, time, one, one times 10 to the ninth in terms of the uh, cross-sectional area uh, of this feature here. And another channel here, five times 10 to the eighth. Gibraltar, so this is presumably had, uh, occurred in the Strait of Gibraltar. There was a massive flood. And where do we see the Missoula down here, two times 10 to the seventh. So two to, one to two orders of magnitude larger in these outflow channels on Mars compared to, for example, the, the Missoula channel that created the channel scablands. So there had to be a very, very large source of, uh, of water to, that would, that would uh, uh, cause these particular channels. I think one of the main uh, hypotheses is that there's, uh, there's ground ice here that may be, uh, may be, melt, may be rapid, uh, uh, rapidly melt due to uh, who knows, perhaps a volcanic activity or some sort of gas hydrates underneath the surface that melt the ground ice and cause these outburst floods. Again, I'm not, not sure how that, how valid those arguments are. And Titan. So Titan is interesting, as I'm sure you all know. Um, there are five primary layer, layers to Titan from the interior to the exterior. I'll show you a diagram in a moment as a rocky core. Is a shell of high pressure water ice, salty liquid water, outward crust of water ice, and a dense, mainly nitrogen uh, atmosphere. But there are clouds, rain, rivers, lakes, and seas of liquid hydrocarbons like methane and ethane. So, again, similar to what we have on Earth, a precipitation regime, but the precipitation is very different. Now here's an example of a cross section showing the rock or rocky. Uh, rocky core, the external shell of ice, and the, uh, the liquid water underneath. So again, this is, the, this is the picture I showed you right at the beginning. So this network is 400 kilometers in length. At the bottom, so from a fairly recent uh, paper, 2020, yeah, it's pretty recent, 2021. Um, these are fluvial channels here. So if you look here, you can see a fluvial channel. It's dark area here. You can see meandering pattern. And this is a lake or a, 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 a sea, if you will, of, of methane flowing on top, sitting on top of, of the crust of water ice. So these are equivalent of kind of bedrock channels. Perhaps it would be similar to, uh, we saw that example from Utah that I showed you earlier, the entrenched meander. And you can see the river channels very clearly here. Now I'm gonna try to see if this works. This is a model of how river networks evolve and change a landscape over time. It was developed by my advisor, Taylor Perrin, here at MIT, based on theory and measurements of the effect of Earth's rivers on the rocky surface of the continents. But I've been using the model to study Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Until recently, we didn't know much about Titan's surface at all. Uh, we knew that the atmosphere was mostly nitrogen, like Earth's, and that there was also a lot of methane in the atmosphere. We knew that it was very cold, and so there was the possibility that methane might exist, uh, not just as a gas, but also as a liquid. And so it was speculated that there might even be oceans of liquid hydrocarbons on Titan's surface. But we didn't have much uh, more information than that, because Titan's very far away. And even more challenging is the fact that all of these organic molecules in the atmosphere make it very difficult to see the surface. So effectively, Titan's stratosphere is just full of smog. And the observations from Earth can't see through that smog at visible light wavelengths. So there's just a couple of windows where you can take pictures through the smog. And looking at it from very far away, there wasn't much detail about the surface at all. 
in addition to the difficulty of actually seeing Titan surface and taking the images that we now have, another challenge that we have to deal with is the fact that it's a very exotic environment. And so in addition to the difference in gravity, there is a difference in atmospheric composition. And so the liquid that we're dealing with that rains out of the atmosphere, runs off of the surface and makes rivers and cuts into the surface is methane and not water. Uh, the material that's being incised into is not rock like it is in most cases on Earth, but mostly water ice. And so it's not immediately clear that the landscape on Titan should behave like it does on Earth. Uh, and yet we see striking similarities between the landscapes that have been imaged on Titan and river networks we see here on Earth. And in fact, as long as you know what the properties of those materials are, and you use the right kind of theory that takes that into account, you can study the mechanics of hydrocarbon rivers cutting into ice just like you can rivers of water cutting into rock. The problems Taylor described in actually seeing what the surface of Titan looks like were partially solved by the Cassini spacecraft, which entered into orbit around Saturn on June 30th, 2004. It doesn't orbit Titan, but it flies by Titan every once in a while, and every time it does a drive-by, you get a single image of a piece of the surface created by the synthetic aperture radar instrument on board. It's not a normal picture like the satellite images in Google Earth, but rather a radar image. The radar can penetrate the haze. The radar pictures are the highest resolution view we have of large areas of Titan's surface. They're still kind of coarse, about 300 meters per pixel at best, but that's what lets us see the drainage networks, and they're what I've been using to study how rivers on Titan have modified its surface. Here are radar images taken by Cassini. They reveal bright and dark features that stretch for hundreds of kilometers in some cases across Titan's surface. This is one of the images I worked with. The dark Rorschach blobs are liquid hydrocarbon lakes near Titan's North Pole. Cassini has captured images of sunlight glinting off the flat surface of a lake, which is one of the ways we know that the lakes really are full of liquids. The largest of the lakes in this image is called Lygia Mare, named after one of the sirens in Homer's Odyssey. The white lines are valleys cut by rivers of methane that I identified and measured. The longest river network in this image is about 200 kilometers long, though you can also see dozens of smaller networks. In this radar swath, which is 100 kilometers across, you can see some of the most distinct groups of river valleys at the opposite pole, at around 75 degrees south. One of the valleys appears to meander, similar to how some rivers on Earth meander. This image hints at a diverse landscape. Other studies have shown that Titan is home to mountains, which can reach two kilometers in height, and vast deserts filled with dunes. In our study, we compared the shapes of river networks on Titan and Earth to the river networks in our model. On the left, you can see a detail from one of the radar images of Titan's surface, and on the right, a snapshot from the model. We found that many of Titan's river networks are relatively elongated and spindly, which suggests that in some regions of Titan, the hydrocarbon rivers have produced surprisingly little erosion. Based on these results, we conclude that either erosion on Titan is much slower than on Earth, or Titan's surface has recently been renewed, perhaps by a process such as the eruption of icy lavas or by tectonic upheavals. We have a lot more to learn about Titan, and what we're learning could help us answer some fundamentally cool questions about Titan's history. Titan is one of the very few places besides Earth where we found active modification of the surface by flowing liquids, and we're excited to learn more about this familiar process on an entirely different world. So there you go. So uh, these, as, as they were pointing out in that video, it's just an interesting uh, insight into the way these, these things are done in terms of the, uh, looking at these types of features on, the, on other planetary bodies. Um, so th this is the equivalent of, these are the equivalent of bedrock channels on Earth as they've been pointing out. 
So again, you can see the example here, for example, so 50 kilometer scale. So this is at least about 100 kilometer length of channel here meandering. Uh, and again, um, as they said, the hydrocarbons, uh, methane, methane flows and, and erodes the channels and the water ice forms the bed and banks. So it's similar to eroding a bedrock channel on, uh, uh, on Earth. And again, I just showed you the one down here. And here's an example, an artist's impression of a waterfall on uh, a waterfall, a fall, <laughs> what are we gonna call it? A methane fall on, uh, on Titan here as it uh, flows across the, uh, the crust of water ice. And finally, Venus. I don't have too much to say about Venus because there isn't much information on it. As we all know, it has a very high temperature and uh, it's a dense CO2 uh, a dominated atmosphere. And the surface is covered with extensive uneroded volcanic flows. I'll show you a photograph or a picture in a minute, uh, not a photograph, a radar image. Uh, that, and I think I remember something like 95% of the, of the surface of Venus is covered by uh, volcanic flows. But of course, they've done some climate modeling and it suggested Earth-like climate conditions may have occurred on Venus for much of its early, earlier history, similar perhaps to Mars, prior to catastrophic runaway greenhouse warming. So Mars got dry and uh, uh, Venus had some uh, uh, had uh, uh, catastrophic uh, uh, greenhouse uh, effect. So the detailed radar images were taken quite a while ago, 1990-1994 Magellan mission. And the stratigraphic, the oldest geologic units that they can identify uh, have been, were valley patterns flooded by lava that are morphologically similar to the patterns resulting from fluvial erosion on Earth. So the hypothesis here is that the patterns uh, formed by the flooding lava uh, are, the, are the result of uh, underlying fluvial valleys. And again, there's a picture of an uh, image of Venus. You can see the volcanic flows. And here's areas of, that they were talking about in that particular paper. And what they've done here, here's the image. This is their uh, uh, the uh, channel pattern that they uh, interpret from that image. And this is the comparable on Earth. So a trellis shape here, a radial shape here, parallel channels here, rectangular channels down here. So again, I don't, I don't know how seriously one takes this, but uh, uh, obviously enough to get published. And I think this was in Nature, so uh, obvious enough to fool some some of the referees. But uh, anyway, it's interesting. So what do we know? Earth rivers create a vast range of drainage patterns and erosional depositional landforms. We know that. Mars rivers are now inactive, but there are many outflow and precipitation fed paleo rivers. On Titan, um, and there are also sort of outflow channels. On Titan, active liquid hydrocarbon rivers, hydrocarbon rivers create bedrock type channels on a crust of water ice. And on Venus, regions partially flooded by lava flows reflect ancient fluvial drainage patterns. And I believe that's it. So we have some questions here, right? Yeah, let me just get out of this, stop share. There we go. Okay. So the first question I have here from Bruce Breyer is next to the Brahmaputra, what's the orange color? Is the foreground underwater or just shadowed? I don't, under don't understand what I'm looking at. Okay, let me go to that. Uh, next to the Brahmaputra, what was the question again? Yo, th this was a, a picture. Yeah. One of them, one of the, uh, four four rivers, and one of them had a lot of like orange, bright, kind of yellowy orange color. Okay, okay, that one I was looking at. Uh, yeah, that was the William River. Yeah, that was, and that's 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 uh, a tannic acid from the Canadian Shield, so it's 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 material that's uh, 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 dissolved essentially into the into the flow as it's going over the Canadian Shield. So basically, water from uh, from uh, um, are stained from ero uh, weathering and uh, uh, rot of rotting of uh, vegetation, essentially. So, so was that staining? Uh, was that stain in a river, or was that just staining like a sand or, or uh, like? A well, it, it's it's interesting. Uh, um, I was I would work as a field assistant when I was first a graduate student on this particular river with the and the two people that were uh, that were running the project. They published a paper on this. And what they found was uh, the sand that's coming 
down the river before it hits these Aeolian dunes uh, is stained this particular color by the root by the tannic acid. And when the Aeolian dunes drop the uh, sand into the into the river, it's only a couple of kilometers to the lake and it doesn't have time to get stained. So it's white. So they counted the bloody, I, they didn't do it, I did it. And it was <laughs> consistent. I had to count, take, they took a bunch of samples. I had to count the number of particles that were stained orange and the number that weren't. And it indicated that there was an increase in bed load of about 40 times from the Aeolian sand dunes that were migrating into the river and dumping sand into the river. Okay, <laughs> well, right. So you were obviously very involved in that. Oh yeah, I got my name in the acknowledgements. <laughs> <laughs> so Bill Haskin has a question. How does the lower gravity affect meanders and flow rate estimation? Uh, I don't know. Um, one thing I do know though, and I, I thought I had a slide of this. Um, and maybe I took it out. Um, Just some, I'm just looking through my PowerPoint here. I thought I had a slide. No, I didn't, I don't. Um, I, did, I thought I had a slide at one point in here, I must have deleted it, um, of a comparison of uh, meandering channels on Mars. I did have a slide, I don't know what the hell happened to it, but it showed some meandering channels on Mars. And one of the, uh, the issues is, does, does the, uh, as, as Bill would know, does the lower gravity on Mars have an effect on scaling relations in, these, in, the, in the rivers there, for example? The, if you're estimating the discharge of a river from the meander wavelength, the distance between meanders and or the width of the channel, does the lower gravity have an effect on that relationship? And uh, they compared the meandering rivers that they found on, uh, on Mars, uh, with submarine channels here on Earth. So channels that are flowing caused by turbidity currents that are flowing from coastal areas deep into the ocean. So they're meandering channels underneath the ocean. Uh, the the uh, Lillooet Lake I've showed you, uh, there are meandering channels on the bottom of Lillooet Lake that were formed by uh, turbidity currents or gravity flows uh, that were formed at the mouth of the, uh, of, uh, the Lillooet River. And they concluded there was no scaling effect. So I guess that, that implies that the, the gravi gravity doesn't seem to have an effect on the relationship between uh, uh, on these empirical relationships between uh, um, meander properties and discharge that we've developed for Earth. So that makes it somewhat easier to have some, some, uh, some uh, uh, sense that these estimates are reasonably reliable. Another question from Bruce, which is what features would indicate rivers were active either 3 billion years ago or a billion years ago? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know enough about uh, the, the, uh, um, the overall history or geology of Mars, but they're interpreting these things uh, uh, stratigraphically. Uh, so they found areas where, and I think Janik talked a little bit about this, but as to how they assign, uh, uh, you, some of you might know better than, far better than I do, how they determine the age of these features, I really don't know. He was also asking dunes on Titan. Sorry? He was asking dunes on Titan? I guess. Yes, um, aeolian dunes, windblown, right. windblown dunes, atmospheric dunes, yeah. And someone's asking, is there snow on Titan? Uh, Probably, but it's probably uh, methane, particles of methane, I don't know. <laughs> methane ice, I think. <laughs> Can I clarify that, you know, when, when they said dunes on, on Titan, I thought, well, well, the rock there, the rock is, is ice, right? Yeah. And I was really having a hard time imagining like sand ice, right? But and then I thought, oh, was it sort of like snow or like, or? Like, is that what they are thinking of? Like little, little crisp, little tiny sand? Again, I, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, that would, that's what I would think. I mean, there'd be, there'd be individual, individual particles of water ice and probably uh, a methane ice as well. I mean, I don't know. Maybe some areas it gets colder and then the ice, I don't know what temperature it takes to turn uh, methane from liquid into, uh, into ice in the atmosphere, for example, but, uh, um, 
uh, I assume that, that would be part of the process because certainly uh, uh, the uh, um, the precipitation appears to be methane. Yeah. Okay. And we have Janan from Nanaimo Astronomy asking, how has drone technology changed the study of rivers on Earth? And how, to you, how do you anticipate it will change your study on Mars? Um, well, there, there, there are uh, plans. Uh, what's that thing, the dragonfly? But I believe that's going to land on Titan. Isn't it Titan? Or is yes, that dragonfly. Yeah. So there's that, I don't, and they were just doing some tests of a drone on uh, that uh, was on Perseverance, and I think they had some problems. Uh, you, some of you may be more up to date. I just read that uh, maybe a week or two ago that there were some issues. They did some trial flights in uh, 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 on, of the uh, of the drone associated with Perseverance. I don't think that's Dragonfly, though, is it? I think Dragonfly is Titan. No, Dragonfly is the one that they're planning for Titan. And, yes, uh, correct. Okay. Yeah, the other one but, on Mars. But I can I can tell you that it has revolutionized studies of rivers on Earth. I mean, we have uh, um, uh, the group that I work with on uh, on uh, uh, Klawani Lake in the Yukon. Uh, we're looking at a lake that's similar to Lillooet Lake, where the river flows. The river used to flow into Klawani Lake. And uh, it was fed by a glacier that flowed about five, 10 kilometers and then flowed into Kluwani Lake. And because the water was cold and dense, it flowed under the lake. So we were looking at, uh, at uh, measuring those underflows. Uh, but a couple of my research colleagues went back there uh, after we did our first field season, went back and the river was gone. So the river had been pirated. The glacier that was, uh, that was supplying it had melted back so much that the drainage got diverted into another river valley and no longer flowed into Kluwani Lake. So one of the ways they mapped the changes in, in the river was with drones. And just recently, uh, the group I work with at SFU um, uh, got a, a huge grant from, uh, and I think it was Fisheries and Oceans, to look at uh, yeah, that uh, uh, the Fraser Canyon area and how the morphology of the river there was affecting uh, salmon migration. So salmon, yeah, migration up the river, salmon spawning. And so uh, they got a big grant to do that. And a lot of the work is being used by, uh, done by drones. And I was just uh, on a Zoom call with a graduate student, a couple of graduate students the other day, and she was showing me the scar on her arm because she was trying to land a drone in the Fraser Canyon. And she walk, was walking backwards and tripped and fell. And the drone came down and cut her arm. So, <laughs> so it's, it's not all fun and games, but uh, so yes, it, it has re revolutionized uh, uh, research on earth and I'm certain it, it will revolutionize research of this type on Mars and obviously in Titan as well. <laughs> 